I want to start with a question regarding today, because I know after you guys make your escape and you're out of the building, there is a moment where you get separated and you think to yourself and you say to yourself, was he an angel or was he a real person? And I'm wondering if, as we approach this 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 ten year mark, whether there is still something surreal about that day, as odd as it may sound, to ask someone who was actually there and in it, is it surreal or is it still as real as it was then? Well, the whole day, frankly, uh, just plays like a movie for me. I can uh, I can recall most detail, uh, you know, with vivid color and and. My sensory perception was on high that day, and, and it made a good recording. I can, re, I can recall it minute by minute when I tell the story. So um, there were happenings in the day that were surreal, but uh, to say the whole day was surreal, well, it was certainly unprecedented. It was one of those m- amazing days that really had never, you know, I'd never experienced anything like it, nor had most people that were involved in it. And, you know, by the time I got home, I was, I was amazed that there I was, having gone through what I'd gone through. So there was moments, you know, in the day that, that were surreal, but, but I can recall it all very clearly now. What's the right touch 10 years later? I, I know there's some people who are going to feel bombarded and overwhelmed by these sorts of interviews, the series of stories and specials that are, I, I know you're, you're aware of being done. You're probably, uh, have been interviewed Many, many, I know many times, and are going to continue to be over the course of the next few days as we get closer and closer to actual uh, to the to the ten year mark. Mm-hmm. What's the what's the right amount of I don't know coverage and discussion about this in your view? Well, it you know it's society that dictates these milestones. You know, we had uh, the first anniversary, and I, you know possibly the second, certainly the third, and the fifth, and now the tenth. I don't know. Is it all going to go quiet until the twentieth or twenty fifth? Perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, um, you know, nothing's changed. I, I have this sadness that, that lingers with me. It doesn't weigh me down on a daily basis. I'm grateful for that. But uh, when I think of 9-11, I, I, I have these moments of sadness come over me and think about the, the senselessness of it. And that happens any day. It doesn't have to be an anniversary day. Um, you know, in, a, in an odd way, there's one thing that, uh, and, and this may sound strange to you, that's sort of positive about any anniversary or when I think back on it, you know, none of those people have aged. You know, our company lost 61 people, and their, their image for everybody, for their spouses, for anybody who worked with them or their family and friends, their image is, is frozen in time. They never age. You know, as we get older, we will always think of Bobby at age 35 and Jose at age 32 and, you know, these people that I worked with. So that's, that's a... In, a, in, a, in an odd way, a pleasant thought. Let's create a little bit, or at least part of that day. Um, the the first plane, American Airlines Flight 11, I believe, hits the North Tower. And based on what I've read of what you've said in the past, you believe, your first thought is perhaps there's an explosion above you. Is that yes, correct? Correct. I, I there, you know, at, at 8.46, with my back to the, the window, I was pecking away at my keyboard in, in my office, and I heard this double boom you know, just a, literally a boom, boom. I, I, I learned later that it was, you know, the plane hitting the building and then exploding inside. And uh, the lights above me buzzed, and uh, I spun around because my peripheral vision caught something outside my window, 84 floors in the air, and it was flames right against the glass, just swirling flames. Mm. And they stayed there for two or three seconds and then dissipated. And then out in the airspace, again, 84 floors in the air, was sort of this singed confetti paper just floating in the air. My immediate reaction, incorrect assumption, if you like, was, oh, a welder has hit a gas line a couple of floors above, and that's what's caused this local explosion. And the, as of course, you, 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 your first thought as a fire marshal, as a designated fire marshal, is uh, maybe we do need to get some people out of here. We at least need to investigate it, but fairly quickly you're told and get the feeling that, hey, your building, which was not the one hit first, was very much uh, under control. There was no danger and there was no reason to evacuate, correct? That is absolutely correct. At about uh, 5 to 9, so this would be roughly 10 minutes after our building was hit, um, there was a public address announcement. The strobe lights flashed, the siren gave a little whoop-whoop, and the 
the voice we all knew as the public address system man came on and, and said, your, your attention, ladies and gentlemen, building two is secure. There is no need to evacuate. If you're in the midst of evacuation, you may use the re-entry doors and the elevators to return to your offices, you know, repeat. And he went through the whole announcement again. So the pressure was off. We had about 250 employees, I guess, on our floor at the time. Our company occupied the entire 84th floor. And I would guess in that window of 17 minutes between the two planes, all but about 50 people left our floor, you know, which I'm everybody's happy about with the fullness of time. The At some point, there's a moment where you refuse to look out the window and a couple of other folks that you have talked about do so. Why did you refuse and what did the others see? As I made my way to the north wall of our building, um, the, the buildings were offset a little bit on a diagonal, and from the west wall of our building, I could not really see the north tower clearly, but from the north windows... You could look up nine floors slightly to the northwest and, and, and see this ring of fire around the 93rd floor, just nine floors above us next door. And um, so I sort of glanced at that, but then I'd heard that people were jumping, and I just did not want to have that, you know, that image emblazoned on my retina in my memory bank. And so I stood back from the glass about five yards, and there was a, a, a girl, Susan Polio, her name was, a co-worker, who suddenly saw somebody jump, and she was not aware that people had been jumping, and she just terrified, almost turned around, dissolved into my arms. Oh, Brian, people are dying, she said. And I said, I, I know, Susan, that's a terrible thing. Come on, let's get you a little more composed. And I walked her back to the center core through the, the east to west hallway and left her in the ladies' room at about five minutes to nine. So um, I, I just didn't want that image, and uh, I think walking Susan from the east side to the west side, in, an, in retrospect, perhaps saved my life because uh, it was really the east side of our tower that got uh, the brunt of the blow. The west side was somewhat protected. Even though our building was hit on the south side, it was hit in the southeast corner, and uh, the east side took a beating. And that was, I believe, is it 902? Or is uh, that, uh, 903, as I recall. I mean, I, I think that was the official time. The official time. When you're building, the uh, south tower gets hit. What do you remember about that moment? Well, it, I was talking uh, to a fellow, Bobby Call, who had been down a few floors in the stairway, and he had just come up and was telling me that he'd heard the announcement. And in, in the midst of him explaining that to me, just this, again, this double boom, boom. And in a split second, our room and floor just fell apart. Everything came out of the ceiling, the speakers, the lighting, the air conditioning ducts, the, the whole ceiling grid, of course. And um, being a brokerage firm, our our uh, offices were pretty much on raised floor, two-by-two two concrete slabs um, up on six-inch pedestals for all the cabling to run underneath. And uh, all of that went out of square because the building torqued a tremendous amount. Being hit in the southeast corner, um, the building twisted. And this will sound like a, an absolute gross exaggeration, but I promise you it's as I experienced it. For five seconds, our building swayed very slowly one way toward the Hudson River to the west. Six to eight feet was the sensation. Now, whether it did that or not, I don't know, but that's what it felt like. It stopped, and then for five seconds, it came back to vertical, and with a little hop, all the steel went into alignment or realignment, and uh, this feeling came over me that I was okay um, I, I reached into my pocket and grabbed the flashlight that I had put there 17 minutes earlier when the plane had hit next door, and uh, I shone it around the dusty construction dust room. It wasn't black smoke on our floor. It was just filthy, dirty, chalky air, you know, gritty, spit it out. Um, and in those, in those 10 seconds, I was quite terrified, but those 10 seconds you know, were the only part of the day that I was terrified. Everything, the, the walls tore on a jagged angle. I remember one door frame sort of fell out of, the, out of the wall. It was just a bizarre happening. It was like we'd given a demolition crew a week to destroy our floor as best they could, but this all happened in this one second. I knew, incidentally, it, it, at that first moment we got hit, boom, boom, and everything went dark and, and gray and, 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 and big upset, um, I knew in that split second that it was terrorism because that couldn't be a coincidence, you know, two events happening next door and, and here. And I had been through the 93 bombing, so I, I had lived through that, and uh, hmm. I just knew 
that's what it was. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know about hijacked airplanes or anything like that, but I knew that evil was afoot. Our guest is 9-11 survivor Brian Clark, who uh, was working on the 84th floor of the South Tower World Trade Center, executive VP at Eurobanks, a brokerage firm. You, at this point, have a pretty significant decision to make, and that is which stairwell you choose uh, to, to attempt to escape. Tell me a little bit about that thought process. Um, I shone the flashlight around the room, and I gathered up a group of uh, six people, co-workers, and led them into the darkened hallway, moving from west to east. In each of the towers, there were just two crossed hallways, you know, an east-west section and a north-south section, and they just met dead center in the middle of the building. So in the westerly section, if you, if you then said there really are four sections to the hallway meeting in the center point, um, in the westerly section, there was no stairway. So as we went down that hallway, I had a decision to make at the intersection. If I turned to my right, it was stairway C, ahead of me was stairway B, and to my left was stairway A. And as a fire marshal guy on our floor, my assignment actually was stairway C to my right. So that was my instinct. But when I got to that intersection, a, a, a strange event happened, uh, you know, bordering on miraculous or inexplicable at least. Um, I felt this push on my right shoulder, and it pushed me around to the left. And there was nobody there. It was just a strange feeling. And around to the left I went, away from the stairway I knew, and started down stairway A with this group of people behind me. And with the fullness of time, there are no stories like mine of anybody escaping from above impact um, going down stairway C or B, just stairway A. And what, what I want to get to that later. The the What I've read is that the word on stairway A never got out, that indeed that was a way out. And then, in fact, we're, we're jumping ahead a little bit on the story. When you and Stanley end up you know, descending all the way down, you basically, you say it's eerie, that you basically ran into almost no one else once you, you know, rescue him and clear him out of his location. And that's one of the, tra- well, there's so many tragedies from that day, but that's one of the uh, the tragedies of that day, correct? It, it, it is strange that that somehow didn't either get, it, it just didn't appear obvious to some other people, or it didn't get communicated after uh, I had talked to, uh, you know, a security guard on the 44th floor and made a call to uh, 911 on the 31st floor. So it is it is sad, but it's one of those inexplicable things that happened that day. You're heading down stairway A, and I believe you make it down about three floors, and then you are intercepted by a woman who says, don't bother. That's correct. She was a heavyset woman and just absolutely blocked my way around her on the, on the 81st floor landing. And uh, the group of people sort of went bump, bump in, in behind me, so... She was coming up the stairs with a gentleman, and I was in this group of seven, so here were the nine of us on this stairwell, and the debate began, go up or go down, and she just wouldn't let us past her. But I was distracted by a banging noise and and a muffled cry from within the 81st floor, and I kind of dropped out of this discussion um, and concentrated on this voice, and when I finally made it out, what I heard was this this man's voice uh, screaming, help, help, I'm buried, is anyone there? I can't breathe. And once I realized what he was saying, I just instinctively grabbed the shoulder of the person beside me, Ron D. Francesco, a co-worker of mine, and I said, come on, Ron, we've got to get this guy. And now, I don't think Ron knew what I was talking about. <clears throat> but we, um, we were able to, the, the door frame, if you like, of the, of the fire escape had blown off the wall a little bit, and uh, we were able to push the drywall back and sneak sort of sideways through the gap in the, in the wall and the door frame, and I have this sad, very clear remembrance and image of all my co-workers finally deciding that they were going to go up with a heavy set lady. They all turned around and mm. went up the stairs and died. But Ron and I uh, snuck onto the 81st floor, and uh, we had about, I'm, I'm guessing the stranger's voice at that time was maybe 15 or 20 yards away, but strangely, again, another inexplicable moment happened halfway there to the stranger. Uh, Ron, who was right beside me, was completely overcome by the smoke. Um, Ron turned around, he left me on, off, on the floor, on the 81st floor, went back to the stairs, and he went up. Now, with the fullness of time, we learned that he eventually did come down. He is one of the four people from above the impact zone who, who did escape. Um, but no, his first instinct was to follow those people up the stairs. And what was strange was the stranger ahead of me, who I haven't met yet, is saying he can't breathe. Ron, right beside me, is completely overcome with smoke. But around me, <laughs> inexplicable, miraculous, 
is a bubble of fresh air. I was completely breathing normally and in clean air. So I continued on. And uh, with my flashlight, it was like a high-beam headlight.